So last uh, week I introduced the idea that non commutative geometry can be taken as a basis to unify all fundamental interactions. And um, so what I did is that I defined uh, what we mean by a non commutative space. I gave the definitions. And uh, so with certain properties, and uh, just as a reminder, just said that there's a spectral triple, and I defined these five quantities and the relation among them. And uh, then the question, of course, is uh, uh, if a non commutative space is the basis to unify the interactions, then the question is what kind of non commutative space should we take, you know? And, uh, as a starter, uh, I made an assumption, and the assumption I made is that space time R is a non commutative space which is formed as a product. of continuous four-dimensional space times some uh, finite space. Now, uh, four-dimensional spaces are well understood. And uh, then I went to see, essentially, what one should take for the finite space? You know, what kind of space should one take? And uh, <clears throat> so for that, uh, started by classifying spaces which fit certain physical criteria. And the physical criteria that we need is the following, that, um, you know, the Hilbert space, which would a space of, you know, fermions essentially for us, um, would, um, would include all the fermions. And in this case, actually, the fermions just satisfy certain properties. And uh, so essentially, we said we have fermions. But because, actually, of the presence of what we call the reality operator, one really requires, essentially, what would like to require, essentially, that the fermions are uh, real, which in physical language means majorana. And in this respect, of course, actually, the presence also of the gamma operator, which is a current operator, would allow us always to impose this condition. So what we really have, we know, we say we have current spinners. Now, then, of course, actually, if you act on J on Psi, you are really getting to get something like the conjugate spinner. And the question is that is this an independent set of, of fields? If it's an independent set of fields, then you really immediately face the problem that all your particles will be doubled. You, know? you are really going to get, for every particle we know, a mirror particle. And, you know, something, sometimes it's called the mirror Fermi problem or the mirror doubling problem. And usually, it's not e easy to solve this problem. Uh, now, you know, we are really working in Euclidean space. And the, the issue, of course, is that uh, if you really go to Euclidean space and you said, I would like, uh, so uh, then if, you, but the physical space, of course, is Minkowski. And if you would like to impose both condition that G psi is psi, then you, the, this actually would impose certain condition on the properties of the space. And, you know, as I have shown last time, that would impose a condition what's we know as the KO dimension. So in uh, Minkowski space, you 
you really need to impose both conditions, that j psi is psi and gamma psi is psi, and this would imply, actually, that the KO dimension of this space is equal to zero, is equal to zero, uh, which implies, actually, that J squared, which is epsilon, should be one, JD is, I think, epsilon prime, DJ, and um, I need one more sign. J gamma is epsilon double prime gamma J, and D gamma is minus gamma J. So these are the properties that we need, and essentially it, it really forces. Now we know actually that the in, in Minkowski you have you know four dimensional space with signature say minus plus 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 or the opposite. And, you know, these would somehow cancel each other, and then you are left with the KO dimension 2, which means that the internal space or the finite dimensional space should be dimension 6, KO dimension 6. So that's actually forced the finite space to have, you know, certain properties and KO dimension 6 then you need certain sets of uh, epsilon, for example, epsilon is really minus one, and I forgot actually, I think um, epsilon prime is equal plus one, and epsilon prime is minus one, something like that. So, then actually one goes ahead and try to understand these finite spaces, and uh, what one discovers, and I will go through not through the proof, but, you know, through the realization of the proof, is that one discovers that the algebras of the finite space, or essentially what one finds, is that the, uh, the complexif complexification of the algebra, so essentially here one assumes that the finite space is characterized by AF, HF, DF, gamma F, and GF. Everything is for finite, and one discovered that the complex extension of this algebra, if you take the center of it, there are only two possibilities, which are either C or C plus C, and this actually is inconsistent with KO dimension 6, which leaves us only one possibility, that AC is C plus C, and really it corresponds to an algebra, which is a variant of, you know, let me call it uh, M N of C plus M N of C. In addition, when we imposed certain isometry on the first algebra, and this is a point actually we don't really you know, understand, you know, we cannot um, give it a mathematical characterization why it should be like that, but it is like that. And uh, the other possibilities are not uh, relevant. And this really reduces this instead of matrices on uh, the complex numbers, you really take matrices over the Catorians for the first and in which actually n is 2a in this case. So n is even, and um, also because one would like to impose the chirality operator on this algebra and elements of the algebra, for example, gamma a equal a gamma. So in this case, what happened is that the, uh, this m of 2a of h, would split into MA of H plus MA of H, for example, plus MN of C, or 2A of C. So the upshot of this is that really the first non-trivial example you can do is the following, that A should be one in this case, uh, sorry, A is, um, yeah, 
This is a made matrix, you know? M A of H. This is should be four A or something. N is uh, let me see. M is. Uh, so it's A which is equal to two. N is two A. Yeah. So essentially, yeah. So essentially, this. Uh, yeah. So essentially, really, the first non-trivial example is uh, uh, M one of H or H plus H. Okay. Let me write it like, like this. And this actually is like four A. And in this case, the first example would be H plus H for the first algebra plus M4 of T for the second. Of course, other algebras are possible. No, but uh, Ali, what is important to say here is that you have the gamma, which is a diagonal matrix. On the first, for, right. For, for M2 of H. So right. You take, you take the even part. It's the even part of M2 of H, which is H plus H. Yeah, OK. So I have to say, OK, this I would say M2AH even, and then it really, at least for the first non-trivial case, it belongs to H plus H. Now, so up to this point, you know, I went last time, and uh, uh, the only thing we are, you know, the assumptions I made are there. Uh, so at one point, one did impose an isometry. If one didn't impose an isometry, then you are really going to get instead of you know H plus H, you're going to get M2C plus M2C. And one really can show that these cases would not be physical, but one cannot rule them immediately, unfortunately. But it's not imposing an isometry. What it is is that if you have a real algebra, then you have three cases. Yeah. The uh, symplectic case, the right. uh, unitary yeah. case, and the other Exactly. There are three. Mm -hmm. And here, okay, we, we choose you know, the, the symplectic unitary case. And I mean, so this is a choice. This is something which is not imposed by the... But you, you could have machine. chosen one. We could have chosen there. Yeah. We could have chosen this section. This is the really the other is actually are not relevant because they would uh, really give you real algebra. For instead of H plus H, you can take M2 of C plus M2 of C. What would it really give essentially? It gives you, you know uh, it gives you an extra U1 actually, you know, which is anomalous. So one really can can work it out. It gives it's a little variation. Everything almost the same except this little variation. It gives you an extra vector, an extra vector which is anomalous. You know, who knows? You know, maybe there is an extra vector lurking in the spectrum. But uh, you know, people are talking. You know, so recently there was some uh, papers in which they said they observed something which deviates from the standard model. And you know, some people said maybe it's an extra vector. So who knows? You know? Anyway, but this is actually the most uh, symmetric possibility. Uh, the, only, the only assumption I made also that uh, left action, this is the left action. And then this is, say, the right action. And then we said this is J B star. J inverse, and uh, we said, and this actually is defined to be B opposite. So this is the, one of the axioms is that left action and right action commute with each other. So this actually has been used. This property really has been used up to this point. Now, from here, actually, one needs further assumption. And you know, I will, I will discuss both possibilities. Is that And this is called order one condition. And now actually we understand this condition. It's really a condition on the linearity of the connection. If one drops this condition, then what happened is that the connection would really get quadratic terms. And uh, we really can work out the possibility when this is not so, when this is not satisfied. But this I would leave to the last lecture to allow, because actually in non-commutative geometry there are examples where this condition is not satisfied, and you know this is what uh, the the quantum spheres. Okay. Uh, anyway, so here it will have really big advantages that connections are linear. Everything is very nice. Everything you know falls into place. Okay. What happens if this is not satisfied? You know this would lead us to grand unified theories and Patti Salam models and things like that. But this will come much later. OK, so what are the consequences of uh, this condition not satisfied? Uh, OK, so I will assume, actually, that this is satisfied. And um, 
on top of it, actually. Now, there's one more condition. Is the question that if we take the commutator of the Dirac operator with the center of the algebra, is it zero or not zero, actually? This is the question. Well, what we have shown is that there are two possibilities. If it is zero, then this symmetry is really intact. And if this symmetry is intact, one can show, actually, that you are really going to get, when one work out the model, which I'm really going to do a little bit later, is that you really get SU4 color, which really corresponds to SM4C as a symmetry of the quarks. So essentially, in this case, you really get a higher color symmetry, which is not observed in nature. And in top, actually, you'll, you'll find out that the neutrinos are all massless. They are exactly massless, which now we know that it's not true. So from the physics point of view, we know actually that the three must be different than zero. Because if it is zero, then you are already in contradiction with the experiment that neutrinos will become all massless. OK? Which would have been OK, you know, until 1995 or something like that, because people didn't know. Uh, we're not sure, actually, whether neutrinos are massive or not, OK? Because they have really this tiny mass that only limits on the masses of the neutrino. Now we know, actually, that they are really massive, but the mass is really extremely small. But that they are massive is, is uh, well established. OK, now, what happened, actually, if this is different than zero? Now, the beauty of it is that if this is different than zero, and for this condition to be satisfied, the Dirac operator must have the following form. And uh, so in this case, actually, I, instead of telling you, you know, in, in description what really happens, I would start, you know, uh, being more concrete. I will tell you exactly what are the representations, what goes on, so that you'll have an idea uh, that this actually, uh, as I will say, um, field is not simply talk. You know, you really can go and compute everything unambiguously, not much ambiguity, and with all the details. So, all right. So essentially, let me examine this in a minute. But I really can tell you that the fact that this is non-zero really gives a unique possibility that you really can give the neutrinos a Majorana mass. And it will explain, actually, why the masses of the neutrinos are very small. It really, it's an example of what's, what was known as the CSO mechanism. So here, it really comes out naturally, and it solves the problem in a really very nice way. So let's, uh, let's see how things would look like if I wanted to go ahead and do some computations, you know? What should I do? So now. So this is really my starting point. I'm really going to take H, the algebra A, to be H plus H plus M4. And this, remember, almost uniquely we were led to this. It didn't come out of the sky, you know, out of classification. This was the first non-trivial result that we have. OK, so if essentially, if I would like actually to represent an element of A, how would I, I write that? Then I am going to write it in matrix form. You know, I'm going to show you that everything that we do is really matrices, essentially. We really can use tensorial notation if one would like to simplify his life. And, you know, recently, you know, everything that we do can, can be put on the computer. So in the end, one doesn't do much calculation. You just write it on Mathematica and press a button and it gives you the answer. So, you know, it's, uh, all right. So the, I'm really going to use, uh, you know, index notation. So essentially here, what I'm really going to say, uh, all right. So in order to tell you what my notation, I really have to tell you what are my spinners, okay? So the spinner, actually, as you see, it belongs to this guy. So what I'm really going to write, I'm going to write it as psi alpha i, where this alpha is would see the h plus h, and the i 
let's see the four. So obviously I is one to four, and the alpha is also one to four, but it's a different form. It's the H plus H. Now, and then of course, actually, I'm going to write this as, you know, A dot A, where this is, has two indices, like one, two, and this is one dot, two dot. So this actually tells me that it's a doublet under the Catonians, you know, doublet left, doublet right, and what we write actually, we write as h right plus h left because we have already graded the algebra. And in this respect, my spinners will be psi a dot i and psi i, okay? So, how many spinners I have? I have 16 spinners. And of course, they, we have also the conjugates, but the conjugates, we're going to see that they're not really independent spinners because the fermion Dublin problem is solved through, you know, the Majorana condition. We are not really going to say J psi equal to psi. The problem in, in, in Euclidean space is really solved in, in a very clever way by, you know, in the path integral formalism that only chiral fermions get integrated and they give square root of determinant instead of determinant. So it's really solved in really very subtle way. You know, this is a nice discovery. You, know? mm. you. you get the five you know, to. Anyway, so you see actually now, you know, without really doing any work, I have already, I've already obtained the correct classification. First, actually, we already predicted that you have 16 fermions, which is exactly, per family, of course, which is exactly what we have. And we would also actually find, let me, you know, let me write this, what is this? Uh, the I. The I eventually, you know, when this condition, the D with Z of A is different than zero, will also be broken into one and I, where I is one, two, three. So that actually will be the color index and this is the lepton index. So this is lepton, and this is the quark, and then you can see that the lepton is the fourth color. It comes out of the fourth color. And in this respect, you're really going to get psi one dot i, psi two dot, sorry, psi one dot one, psi two dot one, psi a, sorry, one dot two dot, and then I have psi i, which I'm going to leave it as psi a one, oh, then I have actually psi one dot i, psi two dot i, and then I have psi a dot one, psi a dot i. What is this? You know, remember, this is a dot means, when you see dot, dot means right. So this would be what I'm going to call new neutrino, right? You know, why I give it the name? Because it comes out like that. The quantum numbers tell me that this will be a neutral guy. But this comes out, you know, I name it according to the usual naming and it would agree, okay? And then, of course, this is a right. And uh, this, of course, is upright. This is downright. Similarly, psi A1 is the doublet, which is a new A, a new E. It's a doublet. You know, A is 1, 2, left. And this is up, down, left. Okay? <clears throat> so you see, actually, <clears throat> without doing much work, we obtain the correct representations of the particle spectrum of all the fermions, we know which representations they are. So one really can write that the 16 in this case is a 4, 4, 4, and this 4 is decomposed into 2 plus 2, and this 4 is decomposed into 1 plus 3, and then this is 2 right plus 2 left, and this everything that we see belongs to that representation. Everything falls into place. Okay, so now, <clears throat> So these are my 16 spinners, but remember actually, you know, I have the J psi, and so my spinners will be psi alpha i and then psi alpha i conjugate, which I'm really going to call psi alpha prime i prime. They're not independent, but they are related through the J, okay? What does it mean actually? It means if I would like now to write the element of the algebra, you know, I can write it as follows. I can write it as uh, this one, you know. Uh, remember, this is, belongs to the second guy, 
plum 4 of C. So it is something like this. And this is delta uh, alpha beta. And this is like y i g. So you see actually how an element of the algebra is satisfied. And then you can form the B uh, opposite, which is J B J star or J inverse. And you discover actually what happened is that here you are really going to get the Y times one. So you get Y I J essentially transposed into one. And here you are going to get the X alpha beta into delta I J. And if you look at, you know, this element and this element, obviously they commute with each other. Why? Because then this is don't talk to each other. This is in the first algebra. Well, this is now in the second, and they don't talk to each other. So essentially, GB star, you're yeah, absolutely right. And this is actually, I wrote it as uh, transpose, but you know, a star is, okay. Uh, <clears throat> so essentially, we can write it in this form. So the first, a, B opposite is satisfied automatically. Now, where do I go from here? Then I have to satisfy this condition. So this actually is really a condition. It's, it's a condition on, on the D and the algebra, both, you know. Because what happened is the following. You try to satisfy this condition, you work out the matrix representation, and you obtain actually. I mean, you, you mean the commutation with the center, right? Uh, this is equal to that. I, so you are right here. No, this section, you are right. D with. Yeah, it's exactly. Yeah. Uh, different zero. This is different than zero. Uh, on, okay, so this actually, we have to assume it's different than zero, and then actually this really would require the form of the Dirac operator to be as follows. Okay, one can show that you're going to get something like this. Let me call it, I don't know, let me call it DAB or something. And here we are going to get the bar. Here we are going to get something. And then one can show through a little algebra, Actually, I learned it through abstract proofs, which, you know, beyond me. But uh, through little algebra, one can show, actually, that the only operator that satisfy is the following. That here, you can have only one non-zero entry. Only one. Anything else would not satisfy this condition. OK? <clears throat> of course, actually, this, together with that, we have also to make sure that dA would be opposite is equal to zero. Putting the two first, actually, first we know that here we must have a non-zero element. The question is that the whole thing could be non-zero. But because of this con the first condition, you discover actually that this is possible if and only if you have only one non-zero entry. What does it mean actually, this one non-zero entry? Let me write actually the expression for you. And let me see how does it look like. You know, I have, remember, when I write the Dirac equation, what do I write? I write psi star deep psi, or I can write it this way, you know, psi deep psi, okay? In, in a product. So this is my, say, Fermi action. And in this Fermi action, if I expand, and then I just look at this term, what does it mean? This actually, if I look at that classification, it really tells me that you really have an element, which is this one. If I have more, it would mean that, for example, uh, the up, the down, everybody will start getting Majorana mass, but you're getting a Majorana mass would break charge, uh, would break the charge conservation, because in this case, they would not have zero charge. So the only term that you're in physics-wise that you can write is a term which is really neutral. It must be neutral, otherwise, you destroy charge conservation. And it's not an accident, actually, then, that you can have only one non-zero term, and this one non-zero term would really correspond to the mass, Majorana mass, of the right-handed neutrino. Now, I'll explain later, actually, that why this is really extremely important in order to solve, it to explain, essentially, why the neutrino masses are so small, okay? So this actually is the result. It tells us that, you know, in order to agree with the observation, the Dirac operator should take this form. It has only one non-zero entry. 
and the rest are zero. This D and this D bar are correlated. They are, you know, one is the complex conjugate of each other. And the only thing I have to find is that what's the form of the Dirac operator in the finite space? Okay? So what, what, what shape does it take? You know, the, the, whole, the whole idea that things really are really constrained. You know, because in, in a way, we have to explain why the standard model. This is actually, you know, why the standard model. So if the hypothesis that everything comes from local geometry, we must really arrive at this answer in an almost unique way. Hopefully one day one would have fine and say, okay, here it comes, this is without any ambiguity. But you know, there's always the possibility that you have to put some physics, because if you don't put any physics, in principle you can get anything, right? Because you know, if, if I don't want to explain nature, then uh, you know, I can start with, uh, with the smaller space or bigger space, okay? Uh, well, you cannot start with too small because if you already assume that it's four dimensional continuum times finite space, okay? And the finite space has k dimension six. Yeah. And then you make a very minor hypothesis on, on that space. Then you are already led to the 16, so it cannot be too small. You know? No, this is the first example, but then you cannot rule out why it's not bigger. Oh, no, of course, you cannot solve it. You know, the, the question is that can I say uniquely, you know, this is the only thing I would ever get, you know? Uh, of, but this is the first possibility that one gets. Okay, so now actually, what do we do, where do we go from here? And uh, what we do in the following then. So we would like actually to see what type of Dirac operator can we have, this DAB. Now remember actually the D satisfy many properties. I've written them up. So you really have to, satisfy, to show, for example, you have to uh, verify that uh, what the array, that G D, J D. Still, I'm talking about the finite space. Remember, is equal to J and gamma J equal minus J gamma and D gamma equal minus gamma J. So these properties I have to satisfy, and so if you do that you immediately discover, actually, that the Dirac operator of the finite space really takes simple form. Remember, you know, let me write it in terms of uh, new right, E right, because I don't want to write one dot and two dot, because then it's, it's uh, more physical. And uh, new right, E right, and then I have, say, new left, E left is a doublet, and then up right, down right and uh, up left, down left. Okay, this is really a doublet, but these are really singlets. Okay, why is a singlet? Because actually, this sigma really breaks the algebra from, you know, for this condition and the other condition to be satisfied, and then you put the sigma. What you discover is the following that this algebra, h plus h plus m4 of c, is really broken. And obviously, it must be broken because you put the sigma, remember, this is like 1 and this is the i, and this really breaks the color index. It breaks the color index into 1 and the 3. And in this respect, the m4 of c is really broken into c plus m3 of c. However, because that, that condition DAB opposite is equal to zero, it really, what happened, and then it breaks, actually, this is also broken. You know, because this is one index, we'll talk this one index, and then actually, essentially, this is a C plus C, it breaks, it breaks, and the three are not independent. What one discovered, actually, that the element of the algebra A takes this form, in this case. So you are going to get, you know, X, X bar, this is my first H, these are my first quaternion. In other words, actually, remember a quaternion takes the form like alpha, beta, alpha bar minus beta bar. It tells me that in the first H, it must be of this form. Now here, what do I have? I have a quaternion. So this is my first four, and this is my bottom four. And in the bottom four, what do we really have? We discover, actually, that this is X, 
and of course this is zero, and this is m, where m is an element of m3 of c. In other words, actually, what, what we discovered is that the three C, the C here, the C here, the C here, are not independent, and they are essentially one C, and the finite algebra of the finite space really breaks down to C plus H plus M3 of C, which is really a symmetry of a standard model. It really comes out of the requirement that there is a Majorana mass for the neutrino. You know, this really has drastic consequences. Okay, so with this action element of the algebra, I go with the D, and then we, we can really classify the D, satisfying all these properties. And, you know, I want to cut the story short. What happened is that the only non-vanishing elements of the D. There is one more requirement that we have to put in order to really completely single out the D, and that the D commutes with... No, actually, um, yeah. D commutes with the element which is lambda, lambda bar, lambda, lambda bar in here. If you do that, then you discover actually that only the non Yukawa coupling of the, of the Dirac operator are non zero, and we are really, we have the Dirac operator completely singled out. If I want to write it down, I can write it down. Let me write it down, actually. So, how does it look like? Many zeros. I think here you are going to get K nu, and here you are going to get Ke, which is actually the Yukawa coupling of the neutrino and Yukawa coupling of the E. And uh, similarly here, you are going to get, uh, this is nu left, E left, and this is K nu right. K right, like that. And similarly for the quarks and the only of diagonal elements you are going to get. And um, yeah, here also. So this is K up, K down, in diagonal form. So in other words, actually, you know, after some matrix algebra, one would know exactly what the Dirac operator is. So what do we do with this now? What we do with this is the following. Having determined that... Exactly. So, you know, many, you'll get many, it's the essential point that you get many zeros. By, you know, gamma D minus D gamma will tell you all diagonal elements are zero, you only get non-diagonal elements, and so on. So it's little matrix algebra, nothing much to it. And however, once one is finished, one can proceed as follows. Not that we have not really talked about dynamics or anything, we just talked about classifications and representations and satisfying the properties of the non commutative space. And we are led almost uniquely, actually, to what do I call that of the standard model. Now, remember now, I said that the Dirac operator of the full non commutative space is equal to the Dirac operator of the manifold cross one plus gamma 5 cross df. We have been, what I, I was talking about up to now is the df. We know now exactly how the df looks like. dm, of course, we know because it is the, uh, the direct operator of the usual, say, Riemannian manifold. And uh, similarly, we can say a equal a of the manifold cross af and J, everything is a product, actually. Don't have to write it down. All right? Now, remember, actually, here, one, more, one always starts with non-fluctuating D. So we start with a non-fluctuating D. Say, let's start with a D, which corresponds to, say, some flat space. Starting from a D from a flat space, for example, you can really start with, you know, gamma mu, D mu, like that, actually, for the D. And um, we know actually that you really can generate the metric of the dm out of fluctuations. These are the outer fluctuations. And this is easy, actually. What you have to do is that you say this is e mu a gamma a. You make this as a function of x. You discover that you have to add a spin connection. 
in order to make the thing, uh, in order to make the thing covariant. And uh, so that actually is easy to do. Uh, similarly here, we have seen last time that the D always go into DA, where DA is a D plus A plus J. But that's a good for the global. Yeah. Well, what you have written there is for the global. The, here is the global. Here is the inner automorphism, no? No, no, but I mean, if you want to do the fluctuations, you do that for everybody, of course. I, I do for exactly. You know, we, we get both inner, but I'm trying to say that if you'd like to get the gravity, you have to do the outer, and you want to get the other, the A. Yeah, but these are inner fluctuations by definition. Yeah? Exactly. So, they are one forms in this language. And it is ADB. This looks actually very simple, but remember, actually, the A we have written is what? The A we have written was a 32 by 32 matrix. <coughs> the D was the 32 by 32 matrix, tensored with the Clifford algebra. So you're really talking about. Now, in addition, actually, we said everything we know is really for one family, and I have written here, for example, K. And k I've written as a number, but in reality, this k is the three by three <coughs> matrix in generation space. So you mean it's a ninety-six? So three ninety-six. So thirty-two times thirty-two, and tensored with the Clifford algebra. So it's three three hundred. I don't know, eighty-four by three hundred eighty-four matrix. Yeah. This is actually why it's 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 uh, it's much easier in, uh, instead of writing you know matrices because they look huge is to put it in tensor notation because in tensor notation you just put an index and you don't care how much it runs because you know you know how where does it sum, so it becomes really efficient to do it. Of course, we didn't do it like that in the beginning because you know for years you have to struggle with all these matrices to see what acts and it took some time actually. You know this was uh, progressing. Developments. All right. So this actually here. You say, all right. You know, I would like to compute this guy. How does it look like? Okay. Remember. So I will give you an example. You know, the reason I, I want to, to show you that things come out. That it's not that you say, ah, oh, the gauge fields come out, the Higgs field come out. You know, and people think that we are cheating because we know the answer. We put it in, and then it's not true. You know. Everything comes out in a very well-defined way. One really cannot cheat in any way whatsoever. So, you know, I can say, okay, A, B, and then you can put indices like A, A prime, and then you can put D, B, like A, C, C, B, and, um, and so on. So then I can look actually at all the matrix elements A, B. And how do they look like? So I say, okay, how do they look like? It's the following. I go back to my representation, and then I'm really going to get an element here, like, you know, one dot, one, one dot, one. Remember, you know, I said A, alpha I, beta J, and this alpha could be one dot, or two dot, and the I could be one and the I. And you see, now I have to take all possibilities into account. If I think about this, what is this? This would be the gauge field acting on the right-handed neutrino because we define the right-handed neutrino to be on this corner, okay? And in this respect, you know, you'll discover actually that um, this guy would be zero because the neutrino, the right-handed neutrino, is massless guy. Yeah, sorry, is, is a neutral guy. Is a neutral guy. So, you know, then of course, actually, the next guy would be A2.1, 2.1, and so on. And this actually we discover is a vector. And then, you know, it is given by minus i over 2g, I don't know, b mu. So, you know, it's a vector. And with a gamma mu. Everything is tensed with the Clifford algebra. So, you get that this guy is a vector. In addition, you, are, you start actually to get something like, you know, a guy like A1. Dot one, one dot A, you know, and then, you know, it's a doublet index. A, you remember, is an SG2 index. And you discover, actually, and then you put A is one, two. And what you discover that this is really proportional to gamma five HA. This is where they 
And this is where the eggs enter. So the eggs enter as inner fluctuation, and now I say, what is this thing? Why I went this way? This is an off-diagonal element, and the off-diagonal element, it means that, you know, it's really trying to connect two elements of the left and right algebras with each other. I mean, in fact, it's very visible when you write d equals dm times 1 plus gamma 5 times df. I mean, you know, so mm -hmm. dm times 1 will generate the gauge boson. Right, yeah. And the other one will generate the x. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. One really can see it. Uh, but, of course, you know, you really cannot see, for example, here it's really easy if you to see that it's a doublet. What's not so easy, actually, is to show, for example, the other guy, the a2 dot 2 dot, for example, uh, 1a. Yeah? In this case, you say it's gamma 5. And what happened, actually, it is a, b, h, bar, b. You really cannot get guess ahead of time that you are only go to going to get one Higgs and not two, two Higgs doublets. The fact that you get only one Higgs is really related to the fact that these guys are related. Remember, I told you you have C plus C, and then because we are talking about the same C, it tells you that, okay, you know, you really cannot have different Higgses. You are really going to get the same Higgs. So, so the upshot of this is that one really can do this calculation. It's a matrix calculation, no complications. And after some algebra, one finds the, the Dirac operator, including fluctuations. What does it mean? It gives me the connections. It gives me the connections on the space. And the connections are nothing but the gauge fields and the hex fields. Nothing else. So, so up to here, you know, we have, uh, we can achieve that. And before doing anything, I can tell you that the Dirac action for the fermions, okay? Okay, you know, one really has to write the jip psi. I'll tell you actually now, maybe I can tell you what the, why we can write the jip psi. The reason we write the jip psi because in, in Euclidean space, I really cannot say jip psi equal to psi. It's, it's, yeah. So, if in order to get, once you write j psi, what really happened is that when you integrate on the d psi in the path integral, then you really, this is an anti-symmetric product, and you don't get determinant of dA, you get the Pfaffian of, of dA, and the Pfaffian the square root, which means that it's really a chiral integration, and you have not doubled the degrees of freedom. Okay? Now. Anyway, if I expand this, what do I really get? I really get all fermionic kinetic terms. For example, nu bar d nu plus e bar d e plus left and right and everybody, plus vector Fermi Fermi interactions plus Higgs Fermi Fermi and you get exactly the correct hypercharges and everything actually why one would get the correct hypercharges exactly because of this actually if you really work out the J A star J inverse they really come and they bring actually the U ones in a really completely funny way and in, in order to to have the matching. And uh, here, actually, one does actually makes an assumption that one takes SU of the algebra, not the algebra. In other words, one has to make a requirement that the trace of the A should be equal to zero. This is another condition that we put in. OK. So, so here, actually, it's the first check. Everything Ferminic-wise works. and. It works perfectly. So what's next, actually? What's next is that you need to make, so the fermions are dynamical, but the bosons are not. So how, how do they get the dynamics? After all, you know, we say that we have a curved space. The curved space should have dynamics. And uh, we should be able to describe the full interactions of the system. See, up to now, I have been speaking classically. Everything here is classical. Now, so here actually comes the idea 
of the spectral action. And the basic idea is that the Dirac operator, which was really the building block of the non-commuted space, in principle, one can study the spectrum of this Dirac operator. So you study the eigenvalue problem, and you look at the eigenvalues. And we know, actually, from studying, say, Riemannian geometry or the Dirac operators on Riemannian manifolds, that the eigenvalues are geometric invariants. In other words, they, all the geometric invariants are included, actually, or, you know, lambda is a function of all the geometric invariants. So, so now the question that how can we extract this dynamics? How can we extract this, uh, the information about the lambda? Of course, it's not easy to simply work out lambda of every space, so we need something more general. And uh, so the basic idea is that uh, since the spectrum knows about the geometry, we took as a dynam the dynamics of our system is conjectured to be given by the trace of the function of a d, where f is a positive function. I think you have to put a scale, otherwise it doesn't make sense. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I was going to talk about the scale in a minute, because, yeah, D has dimensional operator. Remember, it is, say, it's gamma mu, say, D over DX mu. And uh, this actually has dimension one. Therefore, you really have to divide it by something of dimension one. Now, of course, actually, you may ask what is lambda. And I will talk a little bit about, uh, you know, dealing with the scale later, because this is really a very sensitive issue. What you should do with the scale? Can you get rid of the scale? Or what are we talking about? I of course. I want to add something, <laughs> which is that this expression, trace of a function of D, is the only expression that you can write which is additive when additive. you take disjoint spaces. Mm -hmm. See, the action should have at least the properties that if you take two disjoint spaces, it should have. Right. Uh -huh. This is the only expression you can write. So you want to say F. But d1 and d2 should be disjoint in this case, or what? Yeah, sure. <laughs> if you take d1 and d2 to be disjoint, so it takes the, di the full direction f of d1 plus d2, okay, then it's certainly true that you know the trace of that will be the, the sum. What you got? What you got the function? And then there is a converse to that, which tells you that if you take the functional, which is spectral, mm -hmm. and fulfills this additivity property, then it has to be on this one. But what about the positivity? Positive because, you know. Positivity? No, no, no. Is, uh, but it's important for Euclidean actions, no? No, no, of course. I mean, <laughs> if you then require on top of that, it's positivity. <laughs> because some people have been, you know, toying with the idea that maybe it's not positive and things like that. Anyway, so now essentially, how, how can we deal with this space? Obviously, we really, for an arbitrary function, it's not that easy to work out. But what we can really work out is the asymptotic expansion. This way, one would know how to do. And uh, the idea of the following, uh, we use methods of heat kernel expansion. You know, it's not the only methods, but here actually they, at least for remaining manifolds and for product almost commuted manifolds, they are really very, very effective. Uh, so what's the basic idea here? You say, okay, you know, suppose that I have a function of some operator P, you make some, you know, I don't know, uh, Laurent expansion, you say it's ASPS, and uh, then trace, and uh, then you are you have something like trace of p minus s. The news, the identity trace of p minus s, is given by you know you use the Mellin transform formula, and uh, with the Mellin transform formula, you obtain that. You know, it's really the opposite of the definition of the gamma function, essentially. 
TS minus 1, trace E minus TP, where the real part of S is larger than or equal to 0. And uh, then the next step would be to use formulas of trace E minus TP using heat kernel expansions. And then, of course, actually, this is given by a n of uh, sorry t n minus actually in this case um, minus well n over two minus two okay at least in four dimensions and uh, where n is larger than or equal to zero and uh, this is a n of x b well, DV. And these actually are called the series of quotients. And they are defined in terms of uh, connections of the Dirac operator. So, no. yeah? No, no, it's an asymptotic series. It's an asymptotic series, yeah. Uh, Okay, I will say why it's it's useful in physics because exactly of uh, the LM point is that this is you know the fact of d over lambda and then it will be clear actually when I write the expansion it will be an expansion of one over lambda so the first term will be one over lambda to the four then you are going to get lambda, lambda four sorry then lambda squared then one then one over lambda squared and so on. now assuming actually the scale is extremely large then these terms will become, you know, less relevant. Of course, actually, the expansion will break down once you approach the scale. And, you know, where the scale, you know, you can take the scale to be, say, unification scale or Planck scale. In this respect, actually, the expansion would definitely break down. And uh, in that case, one has to learn different ways of dealing or such expansions. But you know, we did some calculations of this expansion for, you know, Robertson Walker uh, metrics and things like that. And really, it, it holds almost up to the Planck scale now. Up to the Planck scale, it's only when you, you are orders of, you know, like twice or three times the Planck scale, then you, you start to see that it breaks down. But not before, you know, which is, uh, which is really amazing that this uh, action is so accurate that it goes all the way up almost, you know, to the Planck scale, but not beyond, you know. It's just there. All right, so what do we do with this expansion? Doesn't give us anything sensible, because obviously, this looks uh, far-fetched, I would say. That you take an arbitrary function, you say, okay, this is arbitrary function. This is, the Fermi part is, is straightforward, you say psi, deep psi, okay? And you get, you know, the usual expression. You can say it's by construction. But for the bosonic part, it's not really clear that this idea should work. You know, that it should give you anything accurate, essentially. After all, you are using some expansion. All right, so how to proceed, actually? Here, you know, it's known, as I said, here we assume that the continuous manifold is four-dimensional, and in this respect, in this respect, the, uh, the expansion, yeah, what happens is the following, that only a n equal to zero, if n is odd, for many faults. without boundary. Okay. What happens for many faults with boundary? We have already addressed this question. It's more, is actually very interesting, but I will talk about it later. Uh, but for many faults without boundary, a n equals zero, and is odd, it means actually the only non-zero ones are the a zero, uh, the a two, a four, and things like that. And these formulas, were worked out long ago by B, by Gilkey. He has some, you know, standard formulas. And uh, because of that, actually, what really becomes relevant in this is the d squared of the d. Because, huh? D sub a squared. 
Nisem bez kvarja. And uh, what the trick of the following, you write this as g mu d mu plus a remainder. And this d mu will d mu plus omega mu, which is a connection. And this omega mu, okay, this also is given by, okay, there's my, yeah, minus g mu d mu d mu plus a mu d mu plus b. So what Gilke did actually, you know, he gave an expression. This actually is, the, there are two important terms in this expansion. It, the e, which is an invariant, and the connection, the omega mu, and, you know, curvatures which are constructed out of this connection. And this omega mu, he, one reads from the following. You write this expression into this form, into this form, and then you can know actually that a mu is given by, you know, some expression. It is half j mu a nu plus, I don't know, plus comma nu. This is a crystal, contraction of a crystal. In other words, actually, one really can compute all these expressions in a unique way. And remember, we have already computed our D. So we have this D, huge matrix. You take it, you square it, you get another huge matrix, and you write it in this form, and then you try to find the curvature of the space. Remember, it's really a generalized curvature now. And you also get the E invariant of the space. Another huge matrix, you know, 384 by 384, okay? So what Gilke tells us, look, you know, this A is zero, the first term in the expansion is given by 1 over 16 pi root g trace 1. Trace 1, of course, is 384 because it's 384 by 384 matrix. So this is actually nothing to compute. The part which is independent of lambda, obviously. Yeah, sure. This is, no, no, this is actually lambda 4. This is really the cosmological constant. And it's huge. You know, the cosmological constant is huge here. Why it is zero, that's a different story. Okay? Uh, uh, well, this is not quite right, actually, because the uh, coefficient is not one, in the sense that uh, you have the... Things um, effect, you know. You, you want to talk about effective. You want to talk about... I'm talking about, you know, zeroth order cosmological constant. Of course, there are contribution coming from the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs, but these are supposed to be much smaller, actually. No, 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 it's not what I'm saying. No. I'm saying that when you compute this coefficient A0, uh, and when you take into account the Majorana mass matrix, you get another term. Uh, yeah, okay, you know, at, at, it's a negative sign. Okay. Yeah, that actually, but... Um, uh, yeah, but that comes from the Higgs, no? Not really the Higgs, it's from the Mayo and the Ah, you mean the D squared term? The D, yeah, sigma squared. This is a sigma, actually. Ah, sigma, yeah. Uh, Okay, okay. Yeah, but remember, you know, okay. But this actually after. Sigma is, would come later because I see sigma is, lives here now. Sigma lives here because a priori we don't know. Okay. Anyway, so the, the interesting part actually is this guy. So you get actually R over 6 is the Einstein term. And then you say trace E. Now, you let me actually give you an idea what, what trace E is in this case, or what E is, actually. You know, E, you have to read, you have to read by squaring the D, by squaring the D. And so obviously, let me remind you, the D, you have all this D slash part. You have here gamma 5H part, gamma 5H dagger. You have some distance, okay? When you look at the d squared, yes? The off-diagonal terms are really going to give you what? H, H dagger terms, which is really nothing but the Higgs mass, okay? So you discover actually, essentially, and then you trace it, and you, you only get trace H squared. So if you really work it out, actually, in this example, what do you really get? 
here you're going to get the following actually. You get this gives up to a factor so you see this is the guy that would eventually give mass to the neutrinos and this is the Higgs mass these are essentially Yukawa coupling you know square of Yukawa couplings square of Yukawa coupling so we look at this expression and then we notice the following, that the curvature term minus sign. Uh, you mean the whole minus sign? Yeah, yeah. there's a whole, uh, overall minus sign, yeah. See, I write minus, okay, so if you'd like, uh, uh, yeah. Okay, so. Well, we included the one half r into e or not? Minus two over pi squared if you wanted this, f two lambda squared. Yes? Root g d for x. There is a minus sign here, it's true. Well, the notation that r is negative for Euclidean spaces. Anyway, so you see, we get a mass term and with a minus sign, this is really extremely important if you, as we'll see, when, for the standard model, because the standard model is really characterized with a potential V, as you see, lambda over 4 h, no, h bar h squared minus m squared over minus mu squared over 2. And it is the minus sign that gives the potential the Mexican hat. It's essential that you get a minus sign. Now, obviously, you are really going to get a minus sign. Why? Because if you look at it, in the end, you are taking trace of E minus T P. P has D squared. D squared has S squared. Obviously, you are going to get the first term in the expansion, a minus sign. The next term will be plus sign. It alternates, which is extremely nice, you know, because, of course, but you really cannot guarantee that, okay? In principle, before you start. We don't know. Uh, so this actually, important points we can point, that the curvature, which is the Einstein term, and the mass term are really treated on equal footing. So h bar h is like curvature of, is really the curvature of the internal space. And, um, okay, you know, scale lambda squared. What's lambda squared? Of course, actually, one would like this lambda squared to relate to be related to 8 pi g or 16 pi g or whatever, you know. Okay? It should be related to the so this is actually the Planck, Planck squared. So from here one would read that if you'd like to make sense of the scale lambda that we started with, the natural uh, interpretation of it is that it's almost, of course you have numbers, you know, you have F2, it's a Mellon transform of the function, so you can get factors of 10 or things like that, you have the pi squared, so it is of the order of the Planck mass. It's not exactly the Planck mass because you have some factors here. But at least an order, we know that it's of the order of the Planck mass. The next term, the A4. And according to Gilkey, what's the formula? The formula tells me that, what is it? Okay, you have, uh, let me write here. Okay, I'm not going to write the, top, the surface terms. So what three enters 
the curvature square, everything squared actually here. E squared, curvature squared. Now, you know, this E squared, the omega mu e squared, they really give me invariance in terms of curvatures, square of curvatures. What are the squares of curvature? Of course, the R mu nu squared is there. But here, we are really going to get what? We are going to get F mu nu squared, which is curvature squared. And we are going to get kinetic energy of the Higgs term and the sigma term and things like that. So, and Yang Mills, exactly. Yang Mills terms is nothing but curvature squared terms. You know, because what's F mu nu? You know, it's if you take d a squared, as you see, d plus a squared, you know, you are really going to get the F. And the square of the curvature, the square of the connection is the curvature. And it really, it lives here, it lives here, and one really can compute it. Some long calculation, but in the end, is well-defined calculation. The, the important thing is there's no ambiguity at any point, okay? So, in this action, we're going to get F0 over 2 pi squared. And... Vi squared... Dao Bonnet plus uh, plus conformal factors kinetic terms for the H quartic terms for the potential and similarly everything I write here I have to write also for the sigma field and so on. Uh, or sigma squared. Anyway, see the important thing is that first of all, this time there is no scale. Second, we note that we have a vile squared term. Now this is really important for, you know, if you, if you are really doing say Realization of gravity, you know, this term would make, uh, would improve actually the propagator of the graviton. It makes the theory, of course, non-unitary, but of course, you know, th this we don't really worry about because in that case we are cutting, you, are, you have to cut the expansion and, you know, if you would like to treat unitarity, you should not cut the expansion. You, are, you have to take the full fledged theory. But uh, at least this conformal tensor or the vial tensor squared uh, is important for, um, the propagator of the graviton. And now here we see here actually that we really have a kinetic term for the U1, for the electromagnetism, a kinetic term for the SU2 weak, and a kinetic term for the color, SU3. The and exactly, and then we look here and then we immediately find a relation that tells me that G1 squared equal G2 squared, that's five over three, sorry, G3 squared, G2 squared, five over three, G2 squared which is the famous unification one obtained for SU5 or SO10 grand unification theory. We will have actually, we have to talk about this later, in the next lecture, because this is not exactly satisfied. It's not exactly satisfied because, as we are going to see next time, you plot the, you know, okay, the logarithm of, of, uh, of the, developments of uh, the alphas, which is g squared over 4 pi, alpha inverse, of the alpha inverse, then you discover that they don't exactly meet, but you know, this is a different story, you know. Whether they meet, they don't meet, they almost meet, but in principle, you know, there's so much in between that we don't really know, we don't control, and uh, it's premature to say whether this is a bad point or not a bad point. 
that is yeah, all the same order. Yeah. Sure. There, you know, it's it almost, you know, they, okay, within, let me say, within 10% it works. Within 10%, but you have extrapolated 15 orders, 16 orders of magnitude, actually, which is huge. Okay. Yeah. yeah, you know, so th there is, uh, and you know, things we have discovered that things have not really been calculated, you know, to two loops in the model that we have, because this field actually turned out to play an extreme, very important role. The sigma, which a priori we ignored, at one time we even make a prediction that the Higgs mass is given by a certain number. And this turned out not to be correct because we have ignored actually this, this, uh, this field. However, if you take this field into account, then, you know, you're completely in agreement with the experiment. And in addition, actually, the randomization group equations taking the sigma into effect has also only been carried to one loop order. Uh, nobody has carried it to two loop order, so we really don't know. So maybe it will change a little bit, actually. You know, my guess is that it, it will change, but I don't know whether it will change uh, in the right amount, in the right direction, because uh, this is uh, up in the air. Um, so, so let me summarize again. So we started from a very general idea, the general idea that uh, space-time can be approximated by a product of a continuous time discrete manifold. The real answer, we don't know. You know, it may be just completely discrete, but to a very good, st a very good start to, to say it's because we know that general relativity works very well. So we know the continuous part up to the Planck scale works very well. So we can, up to that energy level or a little bit below, we know that the, uh, you know, Riemannian manifold part works. So to assume that we have an invisible extension, which makes it almost commutative, but in reality non-commutative, that we can extend it by a finite space, we entertain this idea, and we discovered that to a almost uniquely, we can predict the structure of the model. We know the Fermi-Nick representations. We know actually why there are 16 fermions, we know what are the representations of these fermions, we know the gauge group. Yeah. Yeah. One generation. One generation. Yeah. 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 We, this actually, yeah. This, this I'm saying that what we can, the things what we cannot do is much more, of course, because what we cannot do, for example, predict, say, the electron mass and, you know, all the masses. Because in principle, you know, if, uh, the, if there is more restrictions on, on the one should be able for this, remember, the finite space contains all the Yukawa coupling. So it contains actually information about, so if you know that, for example, that K is like 10 to the minus two or something, then you know that the ratio of the electron mass to the top quark mass is like 10 to the four or something. So, uh, the minus four. So in that case, like this information we are putting in by hand. We are not, you know, we are not predicting. But if, if one really is completely successful, you would come, everything comes out. But you know, this is really far fetched for time being because you need some extra structure which we really cannot put our hands on. Not not yet, you know. Uh, so there is, I think, there is another aspect. The criteria and the, and the properties that we verified do not really tell, tell us actually why, the, why there are three generations. This we don't know. This must come out somewhere, actually, you know. So this aspect, we have no idea. So why does it need explanation no, for that? We need an why does it need explanation for this yeah. generation? There is no explanation. Uh, as even a guess where else, there should not be a fourth generation. Yeah, I the, this but actually I almost rolled out now, actually, no? No, no, but uh, there are two things to say. Yeah. There is one, or these two Japanese who got the Nobel Prize had a reason why we needed more than two generations. Two, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the Kabibo Kobayashi Maskawa mix right. because it involves a complex number only if you have more than two, strictly. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, three is the first number of generations for which you get a complex number, so for which you get violation of charge conjugation. But then, okay, I think now experimentally it's known that there is no first generation. Mm -hmm. There are very strong tests which have been. Okay, experimental. Yeah. Experimental. But, yeah, yeah. So, why three? We, no, actually, it's not that we don't know. Nobody knows, I would say. Nobody. It's, uh, it's up in the air. Why the. 
uh, masses of the fermions are the way they are. You know, the standard model, after all, has what, 17 or 18 parameters? Sure, but I, there you can say one thing, which is mm -hmm. it's exactly, you know, like uh, if somebody would come and would tell you why is the metric of space time the way it is, okay? You could say, well, uh, Kepler had some guess, but you know, you could say, uh, well, it's, it's like this, it's just because of circumstances. Mm -hmm. So the issue is, what is the geometry of the finite space? Yes. Is it due to circumstances, or mm -hmm. is it, uh, does it have a deeper meaning? Right. And this we don't know. This we don't know. One would hope, actually, see that, look, okay, if so maybe, yeah. well, yeah. Yeah. 20 years ago, you know, okay. You know, before, say, the advent of non commutative geometry, if somebody asks you why the standard model, you see, you could have answered the same. But now, actually, I think we are very close to knowing that it is, it must be like SU3 cross SU2. It must be like 16. So we must have a Higgs field. So this actually have been answered satisfactorily, but we are far from, you know, the full answer, and uh, this is, this is the... There, there could be more than white white Higgs. Or not. not here, actually. Not here. here, okay. If later, if you know, we take off this condition and we really want to push everything to grand unification, then of course you have many more Higgs, actually. Not only one we are going to get, but that actually will be relevant at higher energies. And we will not be able to see what really goes on at lower energy except for the Higgs doublet. You know, it's, it's not clear. Uh, but that's, that's another story, you know. Uh, Anyway, I, I would stop here, I think, because next time I will, uh, I will continue by uh, analyzing the quantum aspects of, of the model and uh, maybe, you know, theorizing a little bit about... Uh, so, what we have so far is the first quantization. Of course, yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just to answer what uh, Thibault has last time. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the first quantization. Yeah, it's a marriage of uh, geometry and, uh, you know, uh, some inverse space setup and so on. That's what it is. Right, right, right. But what is quite, a, 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 one should stress one thing, you know, which is that there are seven or eight signs which have to be correct, mm -hmm. and they are all correct. Uh -huh. and, uh, and moreover, you know, it encapsulates this enormous complexity of the Lagrangian into something which is... Uh, I think, you know, if this thing was done before, you know, this would have been like, <laughs> and then people come and verify it. It would have like you know, a revolution. Yes. But the thing actually lost the luster because people think that, okay, you know the answer, you are fitting it. Yeah. And this is the you know, biggest thing that one has to fight, is the misconception yeah. that there are billions of possibilities and simply we are given an interpretation of, these poss of, of, of the one possibility which is correct, and there are many other possibilities, which is not really correct because, you know, according to this specification that I went through, is that there are not really many possibilities, you know. It's yeah, almost, it comes uniquely, you know. But then one would have to explain why, if you want, the correction by the finite space improves the mm -hmm. ordinary four-dimensional continuum, and mm -hmm. the reason why it improves it, it mm -hmm. changes the Q dimension. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It changes mm -hmm. the Q dimension from four to two. And, uh, and that's a big improvement, because then you can write this far field, so. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, so it, it, it needs to be finite. But it, well, it's the most economical to be finite. I mean, it could be that the splitting is actually more complex, but I mean, the simplest way to see it is that you have a four-dimensional space, and then you make it two-dimensional in pure dimension without changing the metric dimension, which is remaining. But if you have a, you know, if you start finite, then you'll have to fight all this uh, Kaluza Klein modes, as I would say. You know, you have many extra degrees of freedom which we don't see. So, so, so. so a new dimension by something finite. Exactly, by something finite, which doesn't have this infinite number of modes, like in Kaluza Klein. I mean, that's a very, very basic thing. Okay, so.